most awesome passages of Scripture. But at the same time, it is one of the saddest passages of Scripture. And I think you understand, and as soon as I announce the text, you will, a majority of us will automatically recognize it. And it's found in Isaiah 53. Many individuals believe that the insight that Isaiah received by the Holy Spirit about the coming Messiah, and he wrote so artfully about him and so specifically about his life that many individuals call this the fifth gospel of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Isaiah. And I really can't uh, question that or disagree with that. So stand if you would please as we turn to Isaiah 53 and listen that several uh, many many years before Jesus actually came. Listen to this portrayal that Isaiah gives here of the Messiah of the King of Glory of Jesus Christ the Son of God. Isaiah 53, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Once again, very familiar. Isaiah 53, uh, verses 1 down 2 and through verse 8. Everybody have it. Here's what Isaiah says. Who hath believed our report or our message? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are yes, healed. Praise God. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation <clears throat> excuse me for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken you may be seated we could have read the entirety of the chapter but I will uh, leave it there and I want to preach this morning simply on this. Your estimation of Christ or our estimation of Christ. What is our estimation of the Lord? Sad to say, we live in a day, we live in a society, we live in a culture when Jesus has become nothing more than a curse word, if even to that degree of honor. 
And as we look at this passage of Scripture, of Isaiah here, really the nuts and the bolts of this passage is found a couple of times where Isaiah says, And we esteemed him. We esteemed him not. Now what Isaiah is making reference to here, he's talking about the response of humanity when Jesus came to this earth and he came to die for our sins. When Jesus came and was born of a virgin and lived his sinless life, uh, died a cruel death on the cross, was resurrected the third day, that even after all of that, what was the response of humanity to Christ in that? Why, Isaiah said, they, we, all of humanity, esteemed him not. We did not esteem him as Christ. We did not esteem him as the Messiah. We did not esteem him with honor and glory and reverence and acceptation but rather we esteemed him by rejecting him and turning our back upon him and esteeming him as nothing within our lives. This word esteemed it's very closely associated with a word that the Apostle Paul utilized a few times within the letters that he wrote. And I'm thinking more specifically in the book of um, the Philippians in chapter 3 and 7 and 8. Uh, if you want to turn, you can, but, but uh, once again, very familiar passage. Here Paul uses the word I count. I count. And so count and esteem are basically the same words from the, from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Now what Paul is making reference to there, as he said, I count, he's talking about some of the privileges or the great privileges that he had because he was a Jew. And Paul said, these great privileges I count them as great gain. In fact he said I can't think of anybody else that is more uh, or is greater privileged is has more great gain according to the flesh than what I do. Paul said I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the stock of Israel and I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. And he said, when it comes to strictness, I am the strictest of the strict because I am a Pharisee. And so Paul said, I counted all of these things as great gain. But then he said, something happened to me. On my way to Damascus, I had my salvation experience and I came to know this Christ that I was persecuting of how much he loved me and how that he was able to change me and, and, and deliver me and do this eternal work in my life. He said now all of these things that I counted as gain, now since I'm a child of God I count them as law. So you see this word counted and esteemed is basically the same. And what it is referencing, what is your estimation of Christ? How do you esteem Christ? How do you count Christ? Christ. Uh, what is your estimation? What is your consideration? How do you view Jesus? How do you see Jesus? 
And if any indication of what Isaiah says, it's not a very striking estimation. Did you see there where he said that we hid, as it were, in verse 3, our faces from him? We hid our faces from him. Now, we know there's times people will turn away from another individual or they will bow their head in honor or respect or humility uh, because of the person they're standing before. But that is not what Isaiah is referring to. He's talking about rather, let's say that you're walking down the street and an individual is approaching you that you do not care much for. You do not have much respect for them. And yet they greet you and they're uh, kind to you. And what do you do? You don't even recognize them. You turn away from them. You turn your face from them. You do not recognize them. And the reason that you do not is because uh, you uh, hate them. You despise them. You reject them. And so that's what Isaiah says that all humanity did to the Lord that instead of bowing before him and bowing your head as the king of glory uh, we rejected him and we reviled him and we mocked him and ridiculed him as nothing instead of, of this wonderful savior and messiah that he is now in this text, the entirety of this text, Isaiah said humanity did not esteem Jesus very high. And then he gives the reasons why. Why they did not, why we did not initially esteem Jesus very high. In other words, Jesus didn't fit into their mold of idea of how a Messiah should look like or how a Messiah would talk or how uh, a Messiah would act or even the experiences that this Messiah had. Why? Why he claims to be the Messiah. But because of all of these things, it's evident that he's an imposter. It's evident that he is not who he claims to be. And so what I want to do here this morning, I want to go through this passage of Isaiah and look at why individuals and we and even still people today do not esteem Jesus, do not accept him, do not honor him. Uh, but he's, as I said previously, merely a curse word if even that. I want you to notice, if you will, in verse 5 and in verse 10. We didn't read verse 10, but if your Bibles are open, when you look at these two verses, there are two contrasting conjunctions that are very evident and strategically placed. After he goes from verses 1 to 4, he said in verse 5, but he's contrasting what has been said and in verse 10 if you look in your Bibles he said yet it pleased the Lord so but and yet are contrasting conjunctions and what he's contrasting is this the estimation that man puts on Christ versus the estimation that God has placed on him. God is saying you reject him and you despise him. But he said yet, yet, yet he is my chosen one. He is the one that before the foundation of the world that was willing to lay down his life. And you consider him as nothing less than even a man 
but, but, but I have ordained him to accomplish the very purposes and will of Almighty God. So we see the contrast here and we know that even in our lives, it's not the estimation that man has of us that counts, but it's how does God consider us? How does God look at us? How does God view us? So let's look at some of the reasons here that Isaiah said that they did not esteem Christ very high. First of all, because he was the same. Now what I mean by that is they simply said, why this can't be the Messiah because he's the same as us. They viewed the Messiah as some great warrior that is going to come and is going to release them from the bonds of, of the Roman Empire and set them free and, and some great individual, some great king. Uh, but they said, this Jesus, why he's a human just like we are. And so there's no way that he can be the Messiah. Why even in the Gospels they declared, why we know his mom and dad. He came from a very poor family. That can't be the Messiah. And then they said that we know his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph. We know his siblings. We know his brothers. And by the way, they said, uh, his brothers did not accept him him as the Messiah either. So there you go. Even those closest to him initially did not accept him. And they, they would go on and they said, uh, you know, not only that, but we know the circumstances surrounding this guy's birth. Why he was conceived out of wedlock. And surely the Messiah that God has promised us would never ever stoop to the place of being born out of wedlock. Now, you know, once again, I'm saying what they would say, not realizing and accepting the virgin birth. And they said, we understand of the circumstances even further about his birth. Why? Why, do you know that he wasn't even born with a mid? wife at home. He was born in a barn and laid in a manger and the declaration of his birth did not go to the honoraries of our society and the uppity ups of our society, but the declaration of his birth went to a bunch of smelly, stinky, lonely shepherds out in the field. Why? Why? There's no way that this can be the Messiah. And besides, we also know that when the king declared that every child two years and under would be killed, uh, that your father Joseph uh, packed up the family and fled to Egypt. Why, why our Messiah is not going to run from anybody. Our Messiah is going to strike fear into those around him. So there's no way he's just one of us and probably not even as esteemed as what we are. Notice how Isaiah puts it in verse 2. He grew up before him, God that is, and, and before man as a tender plant and as a shoot or root out of a dry ground. Now here's what Isaiah is saying when he said that he came as a shoot, as a root. Uh, literally it means a sapling. He grew up, and so once again, they're diminishing who Christ is. You see, this man that claims to be Jesus and the Messiah, why, he's not a mighty oak. He's not a great cedar from Lebanon. He is not even a fragrant cypress from Hebron. He's not even an apple tree 
tree or a grape on a vine that produces fruit. Any kind of tree that you would imagine that is majestic and big and mighty and fruitful. Why, what is this Jesus done? I mean, he's just a mere sapling that is sticking up out of the ground. I mean, he's nothing uh, supernatural about him. There's nothing great about him. There's nothing mighty about him. And so there's no way that he can be the Messiah. And when it says a root growing out of a dry ground, it's referring to that when plants do not get the moisture that they need, their growth is stunted and they're, they're not very beautiful. They're not strong. And so that is their estimation of Jesus. He's not beautiful. He's not strong. He's not mighty. This cannot be the Messiah. This cannot be Jesus because he's the same as we are. They not only lamented the fact and estimated Christ lowly and people still today because people still say, He's just a man. There's nothing supernatural. He's not God's son. He's just a man. And not only because they rejected him because he was the same, but this kind of goes along with it as well, but I want to uh, further elaborate upon it. He is simple. Now, when I say and refer to Jesus being simple, obviously I'm not talking about uh, academically or educationally or mentally. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about ornately. That he was simple. You know, like Cynthia, she sews these wedding dresses and some of these other ball gowns for these gals. And they have all of this bling and all of this lace and how that they are made. They We consider them fancy. These are fancy dresses. But this dress over here is just plain and simple. So that's what I'm referring to that they say Jesus this man called Jesus why why he's not fancy and and he's not showy and he's not ostentatious and and there's nothing about him that would draw your attention to him he's just he's, he's just a simple plain man and now you see, once again, they believed that their Messiah was going to be some big, strong, mighty individual, kind of like Saul was, uh, you know, when he was chosen the first king over Israel. He was chosen because, uh, why? Well, you know, he his stature, he was head and shoulders taller than anybody else. He carried himself uh, with, with a preeminent and with grace. But this man, Jesus, I mean, there's, there's nothing about that at him at all. He is an humble, simple individual. And how in the world can this be our Messiah? Notice how it says here when uh, in, in verse... Uh, let's see... Oh yeah, in, in verse 2, he hath no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When it says that there was no form, that's speaking of the physical form. Why, he wasn't taller than anybody else. He didn't have a big muscular physique that you would desire a savior 
of the world to have. Uh, but, but he was just a simple average height of, of Jewish men of that day. There was nothing that stuck out, as I said, that drew your attention. And then when it says there was no comeliness or beauty, it's not really talking about the physical form, but it's talking about this grandiose uh, pomp and circumstances. He doesn't come across as, as being a king. He doesn't come across as being better than anybody else. He doesn't come across, uh, like I already said, he's, a, he's an humble individual. So surely this is not, why not surely, we know without a shadow of a doubt, this man Jesus is not the Messiah. Why, he's a carpenter. He's not a king. He does does not have a throne even when he teaches the few followers that he has and that was their estimation that he doesn't have a throne that he sits on and as he teaches them which was the form of teaching in that day. No, this man Jesus, you know what? He sits on the ground. He sits in a lowly boat and teaches the people. Uh, there's no way that he is the Messiah. And he doesn't have servants that is there to do his his bidding, whatever he needs to be done. Why, why, in essence, he serves the people. He lowers himself and washes the feet of his own disciples. What Messiah would do that? What king of glory would do that that has come to save us? And they said he has no money. He grew up in a poor carpenter's shop. Uh, he is a poor carpenter himself now and even when he needed to pay his taxes he had to have Peter to go catch a fish so that he and Peter could pay their taxes now you mean to tell me that somebody as lowly as this is the Messiah I do not think so and so we declare that this is not the Messiah and that's why we esteem him not. When it says here that there was no beauty that we should desire him. That's the last phrase of verse 2. When it mentions that, it means that there was nothing about his physical form or glory or his personality that we would even desire him to be our Savior. We would not nominate him to be our Savior. He would not get one vote if he even ran to be the Messiah. Sad church, sad. But Isaiah was not only declaring even hundreds of years before Jesus ever came of how the people of Jesus' day would esteem him, but down through the, the years and the millennials and millenniums that... Jesus is still esteemed in this fashion. So he can't be the Messiah because he was the same. He's just a man. And because he was simple, he's just not only a man, but an ordinary man, uh, a, a very uh, commonplace man with no hype, uh, not drawing attention unto himself. But the third reason they could not accept him is because of his suffering because he was suffering notice in verse 3 he is despised and rejected a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief yes. he was not only acquainted with grief but Jesus in the entirety of his life was basically married to sorrow and grief even in his birth even in his childhood and then especially as uh, he uh, 
called out his disciples and began his full-time ministry for those three, three and a half years. Why, every page that you read of Jesus in the Gospels, each page has sorrow, misery, grief, pain, and suffering that Jesus Christ suffered during his life and especially his ministry. Why was he not beaten with the 39 stripes within an inch of his death? You mean to tell me that our Messiah is going to be beaten instead of him receiving that kind of sorrow and pain and misery? Why, our Messiah is going to inflict that upon his enemies. So there's no way that he can be the Messiah with all of this suffering. And not only that, we saw when, when they got him and, and he proclaimed or uh, agreed to the fact that he was uh, the Son of God. He was the Messiah. That they laughed at him and they put a crown of thorns upon him and he was mocked and he was ridiculed. Once again, that would never happen to the Messiah. And then they drug him to Calvary's hill and there they laid the cross down and they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross and dug a hole and set the cross up and with a thug went down in the hole so that it would stand upright and for hours he hung upon that cross in misery and pain and sorrow and grief. Grief not only referring to physical pain but the mental anger anguish that Jesus went through. And so I, I, I need not to belabor the point, but in their minds, there's no way that our Messiah is going to be treated this way. This is the treatment of an average simple man that has got caught blasphemy claiming to be the Son of God and he's getting exactly Exactly what he deserves. This is not our Messiah. Oh, There's a fourth reason of why that they rejected him is because they said he was stricken. He was stricken. Notice what it says in verse 4. Because that he hath been often bound with fetters and chains. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in Mark. So I need to go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 4. Surely he hath borne our sorrows, griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him. Notice, stricken and smitten of God. You see, the Bible says that anybody that hangs on a tree is accursed of God. And so when Jesus was nailed to that old rugged cross, they considered him not only to be suffering from the sufferings and pain that's inflicted by man, but he's getting his just desserts because God has smitten him. God is punishing him. God has turned his back upon this man. So why in the world and even on the cross he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so in their minds, that's the very reason why he's not the Messiah. You mean to tell us that this Messiah is going to come from God and then at the uh, midsection of his life, in the very prime of his life, God is going to smite him. God is going to reject him. God is going to punish him. God is going to destroy him. Uh, once again, they said, no, I don't think so. So you can see as we go down this list, how that they were utterly convinced
convinced and, and, and unconvincible that he was the Messiah and that he was the Christ. There is no way. So not only because he's the same as us, he's a man, he's a simple man, but he's a suffering man, but he's a stricken and smitten man, even of Almighty God. But the fifth reason they rejected him is because of his silence. Notice what it says in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the sh slaughter and as a sheep before shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. So they took the silence of Jesus as a confession of his guilt. You know what they say even today. And I know that I would if I was accused innocently of a crime. I would be shouting from the rooftops of why I am innocent. Yes. This is why I could have not committed this crime. I was not there. I do not know what you're talking about. But if an individual is accused of high crimes against the Jewish nation and against Almighty God and he does not respond to his accusers, why? That means he's guilty. And he knows that he's guilty. And he knows that there is no defense that is going to be able to get him off. So yeah, this is not our Messiah. This is not the man we're looking for. So, so just crucify, put him to death, forget about him and we'll move on looking for and watching and waiting for our true Messiah to come and to deliver us. And the last thing that I will mention that the reason that Isaiah said that the reason they rejected him is in verse 8 and 9 because he was shafted. <laughs> Yeah, he was the same. He's simple. He was suffering. He was stricken of God. He was silent. And now he was shafted. Notice in verse 8, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Now the Bible doesn't render any case where Jesus was actually in prison. But what the word is making reference to is that he was brought to this kangaroo court before judgment was placed upon him that he should die. You remember Judas came and gave him the betrayal kiss and the soldiers and the uh, uh, police of the temple. They took him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, and the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling class over the Jews. And they stood there and they uh, finally had a couple of, of uh, people that would uh, uh, testify against Jesus and said, yeah, we heard him say that he would destroy this temple in, in the third day, so he's an insurrectionist. Why? Yeah, this Jesus, he was there January the 6th. So we got to put him in prison. He's an insurrectionist. He's, he's trying to take over the, the government and he's uh, coming against the government and, and rejecting and disobeying and, and rebelling. And so what they're talking about is he never even received a fair trial, but he was shafted. And so what they are saying, the reason they did not esteem him as anything and as the Messiah because God would have not allowed all of this to happen if this man Jesus was the Messiah. So strike one, strike two, strike three, four, five, six, you're more than doubly out, Jesus. 
We cannot accept you. We esteem you as a lowly, simple, poor, humble guy that made no waves, really. Yeah, you stirred up the religious hierarchy and they had you crucified, but you proved to be a fraud. But you see, church, here's the crux of the matter. If you're looking for the Messiah to be a military Messiah, and you're looking for the Messiah to be a political Messiah, and you're looking for the Messiah to come and deliver you from the strongholds and the grips of the Roman Empire. That is what the majority of individuals believe that the Messiah was. And so if you believe him as some great military and kingly figure that's going to bring deliverance to you, everything that we have described does not fit into that imagery of that there's no way he can be the Messiah. But if you believe him to set up not a military or a political kingdom, but to set up a spiritual kingdom, one that would save all of humanity from their separation from God, and one that would identify with men and serve men and have compassion with men and be humble and not bring attention to himself and not utilize his power and position uh, to further himself, but rather to further those that cannot help themselves. So if you're looking at him in the true insight of what God sent him here to do is to save our souls every one of these things fit so the very reasons of why the world does not esteem Christ as very much is the very reasons of why we as Christians as esteem him as the greatest of the great as the Lord of all other lords as as the king over all other kings. Why? Because all of these things, his suffering, his death, was all necessary for the salvation of our souls. Now, no, how could he be a military Messiah if he died in his prime when he was in his mid 30s? No, that's there's no way he could be. But if he is dying and taking the place for you and me and he is our substitute and he is going to an old rugged cross on our behalf and our sins has been transferred over to him and he carried our sins and our sorrows and our grief and all of that. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why we esteem him as great, glorious, and respect and honor Him. So church, what is our estimation of Christ? We know what the estimation of the world is, but our estimation is truly contrasted with what their estimate. How do they look at Christ? How do they view Christ? What do they consider Him to be? What do they consider Him to be like? Not much, but to us, He's everything. He's everything. He's everything. Father, I give you praise this morning. And Lord, the irony that we see all through this passage of Scripture, 
that the very reasons why unconverted men and men of this world would reject Christ are the very reasons why He is the true Messiah. That He is Jesus, the Savior of the world. And Lord, as the angel told Mary that you're going to deliver this child, which is the Son of the Most High, but you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from from their sins. And so, Lord, today we esteem you the highest. We praise you from the highest and to the greatest degree and to the greatest of our ability. Why? Because you are this King of glory. You are this Messiah. And Lord, you are mighty and you have never lost a battle. And Lord, you allowed yourself to be defeated and you allowed yourself to go through this suffering but God it was not on account of who you were or what you did but Lord it's because of my sin it's because of my rejection it's because of my sorrow and my grief you became my substitute and you took my place and so Lord we praise you and we worship you and we glorify you you and Lord what you are who you are what you do how you do it the words you speak the positions you take Lord all of these are right in alliance with what a true spiritual Messiah would be and do and say and experience so we thank you Jesus we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. So church today, as we 